Hi everyone and thank you for joining us again for another PR 360 Live. Today I'm going to be speaking to Catherine Black and then Leslie is going to come on later in the next interview with Susan. So we'll start off Catherine just by having a quick look at your page in our Art360 magazine which Leslie's going to pop up on the screen for us. Um, do you remember what number you were on the magazine? No. Don't worry, no one does. <laughs> we so will sorry. find you. Oh she's got you up already see she's so efficient. There you go, and we can see some of your lovely work there. And that's got your contact details, hasn't it? Yes, so all, yeah, all my details, website and Instagram are on there, yeah. I have to say, I had a stalk of your Instagram and it's so attractive, the feed, it's so aesthetic and it's really fresh and bright and it looks exactly like your studio behind you. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. I, um, I love working with earthy colours and um, yeah, and just, yeah, all that. Brilliant. So if you could start by just telling us a little bit about you. you, what you do and your artist story so far. There you go. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So, um, I mean, um, well, where did it all begin? I don't really know. I think I became really fascinated with working. Um, so I work a lot with women um, and space and architecture, um, but especially working with women it started quite early on it was something that I started to explore at school and um, I was really obsessed with looking at scarification and um, ancient processes that people did to kind of uh, work with the body and um, I think there was a spiritual aspect to that which kind of really ties into my yoga as well and that um, the spiritual path that I'm on but um, yeah, I started drawing women through life drawing and um, and then and then started to work a little bit with sculpture then. And I just loved it. It was that kind of really modeling, working with earthy uh, materials like clay. And um, yeah, so that's where it all really started. And then after that, I went and studied. I did a year away. Um, and then went and did an art foundation course at Leeds College of Art, which was amazing. Um, and just kind of opened my eyes up to all the different ways that you can work creatively. Um, and then after that, um, I applied to get into, to study textile design as a degree. And I was really, really unsure about going to uni, um, didn't really want, to be in education um, and um, re I work a lot, a lot better when I'm learning on the job and practicing what I've then got to preach type thing. And so I set this thing of, well, if I don't get into Chelsea, I'm not going to art. And I didn't get in originally and then I got accepted. And um, so I went to Chelsea College of Art to study textiles and that was incredible working in so many different ways, really, um, really exhausting uh, different mediums to come across like textiles. And it was, it was incredible, but that's kind of how I led, got onto the creative path. Um, and then with that, I tied in bits of experience um, with small communities in my holidays as kind of internships to, well, I really love traveling as well. So it's another way to see the world, but work creatively um, and with people. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I got started. So yeah. That's incredible. And when we were in the green room, you were telling me all this fascinating how India called out to you and you've since done so much traveling. And so you worked in London, didn't you? And then you went to India and then was it South America you also went to? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so I worked after this degree, I worked in, um, which was amazing, but I, I felt like I left with amazing textile skills, but nowhere to put it into industry and found it really hard to find a job uh, that really, for, like, really fills me. Um, and I wanted to be pouring myself into something, but couldn't really find that space. And um, so I worked for the Conran shop for a bit and then worked for a uh, British tank textile company Romo for a little bit as well and well not for a little bit I was there for a couple of years 
And I loved it. I was working with amazing women and people um, generally and designers and all sorts of creatives, but I wasn't actually able to step into that creative myself. And so it was this, I think it was mixed with just overworking Monday to Friday, nine to five, sports, everything going on in London. There's so much energy and I was just picking up on it all and really wanted I just burnt out completely and um it was this i'd been to india with the british council the year before and had started practicing a bit a bit of yoga there and it was right you're going to india and you've got to be doing yoga it was like a real calling and so i was like okay i'm going to india um and so quit my job went to india and my partner at the time and i we then wanted to go traveling so um he went to Madrid while I was in India. Then we met back, surprised everyone for Christmas. And then in the new year, or just before the new year, we went out to South America. And because um, he studied Spanish. And so it's like, okay, let's go to a Spanish speaking country. And I did not know what was in store for me in South America. It opened, it just blew my, what I knew about the world, just, yeah, open completely. Um, so we were in Buenos Aires, I tried to, it was really hard in Buenos Aires, but then we started to work our way up and went into Bolivia and then I got into Peru and I remember looking at him and just saying, I'm home, I feel home. And we were driving by Lake Titicaca and it was incredible, this feeling of like complete homecoming. And I we started working on a ranch and then I went up to Cusco and started working in community up there. And I was doing creative work as well as teaching yoga and um, just got completely absorbed in this uh, yoga, spiritual, immersing the two worlds um, and then came back and, and things have been a bit different since, but they're slowly, it's that path is slowly weaving together, which is really, really, really nice to finally kind of see and feel so yeah and, and and that weaving you were saying earlier that um you're starting work soon is it to buy a school of art therapy as a transpersonal arts counsellor so it's that whole community aspect bringing in your creativity as well yeah absolutely um and I love working with people I'm teaching a couple of days in a school at the moment and it's um although I'm not in the art block I'm it's really nice to be able to work with children and uh, and I work with women, I have worked with women um, kind of pre-COVID. Um, yeah, creatively and therapeutically. So the course is gonna be this amazing way for me to actually, um, yeah, amalgamate the two. So yeah, I'm really, really excited about that, um, yeah. That's really, really cool. And we can see all these tight, like sort of tantalizing views of all the work you do. Um, and we're gonna have a look at your website in a second, but is it possible <laughs> to show us around your studio at all? I don't know if that'll be, or, or show, bring some of your work yeah, to the camera. Sure of course. Easier. If I'm gonna try and move you. So <laughs> if it gets too blurry, just everyone. <laughs> um, So <laughs> I've got a little studio um, at the moment, which is in, my parents garage um and i feel really 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 lucky lucky and very very grateful to have this space um it's a space where i practice yoga and um uh, yeah space for me to explore so at the moment i am fascinated by women so it's all about women and i have worked a lot a bit or a lot with architecture in the past but I've been really looking at different colors and capturing different um, aspects of women when I draw them. So looking at the colors that they really emit and like put out um, and, and I'm starting to work in, I'm trying to move my hand the opposite way. Um, yeah, starting to work a little bit more closely and look into the darkness and the depths and the shadows of what women hold um so it's getting a little bit more expressive i think the more and more i allow myself to um but i mean i also love mark making it's for me it's really a uh, really healing and a really different and exciting way to explore 
um, certain areas or certain things that are coming up. So I kind of I love doodling this um, this kind of line, this continuous like free flowing line, and using water a lot um, is is kind of how I work. So yeah. Um, so which is the piece you've been working on most recently? It would be this one here, the dark one. Um, so it's that one and then actually that one in there as well. So um, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to get my shadow out of it. There we go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's um, just being a bit more expressive with the marks that I use. I tend to, oh, well, I before... I was using a lot of line pair, uh, fight really fine line and less um, less acrylics. I think I was too afraid to get things wrong, and now it's more about actually getting the feeling of something across, as opposed to completely capturing what is in front of me. So, yeah, it's working a lot more expressively, and then yeah, going into the going into the darkness, <laughs> the shadows. <laughs> It just sounds a bit weird, but it's what I feels coming up right now. <laughs> and um, during, um, obviously, the lockdown and COVID and everything, did you find that period of sort of isolation a blessing or a curse for you? And obviously your yoga practice, but also your creativity and your art. So um, I was actually, but when lockdown happened, I was in Liverpool. So I'd been living in Liverpool for about six months and I actually had, I'd done a month's course as an expressive uh, it was an expressive arts course run at the Tate and it was incredible and just so came at the right time and was like right you've got to be working down this expressive art route and then lockdown is kind of all kind of oh it's going to happen and I thought oh where would I rather be in a flat in a city or to be able to get into my parents garden um, and I'm so grateful that they said I could come back because I've been here and I've actually been here since. Um, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was so, I, I feel, I mean, I obviously know there's so much going on in the world and there's been so much pain and so much um, sorrow that's happened. But I feel really lucky that I was able to have some, I, was, I feel like I've been gifted time. Um, to explore and that was really I think what I needed um so the first the first couple of months I actually I started I joined a, a yoga sadhana well, well the first 40 days and so I was practicing every morning and a lot of that was creative work anyway um and so sadhana is like a daily spiritual practice um so and I just felt like a massive opening my website went live in lockdown i i felt like i had time to actually process where i wanted to go um so yeah it was a real blessing for me um, yeah speaking of your website <laughs> i think <laughs> leslie's gonna pop it up on screen you can talk us through some of the work that's on there um because mm -hmm. it's beautiful like we said um i've got it on my yeah. screen but... there we are she's just popping up for us Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to talk us through just some of the work on there. Um, okay, so I've actually only got three of my pieces of art up there at the moment. They are prints um, from work that I have done in the past, but they very much um, are, are the kind of the starter point of kind of where I am. So the Soma is is just capturing a woman in her, all her form um, and seeing the colors that are within and using mixed media to really get there. Um, and being expressive and big, it, it was, that was what was really, was important um, for me. And I actually get them printed locally uh, by Neil Scrace, who is an amazing, uh, yeah, he works amazingly. Um, so I worked with him to get prints of these done. And again, Extend was again about capturing a woman in her, in her, all her form, in her kind of natural beauty. Um, again, looking at the colors that were coming from her that day and, and just working with them and, the, and all of that. So yeah, um, 
my other piece that is on there is the St. Paul's, which is more of the mark. It goes back to mark making and actually was something that I was really exploring at uni. And it was to work. I lo- I quite like maths, weirdly. Mm. I love the, I love how curves and things all work together. And so I was looking at um, buildings in London that kind of offered like mathematical kind of, I don't know, pleasure. It was really strange. It was, yeah. And St. Paul's dome was what really caught my eye at the time. Um, and so it was all about, and then it became about building up a mark and working with a mark over and over again. And it actually transitioned into a final piece that was um, uh, an interior textile piece. So that was really interesting, but that was one of the original drawings. Um, but yeah, so it's all about exploring whatever. Um, but yeah, my website is basically highlighting what I do and what I offer, and that is um, this, yeah, uh, I don't know, the work between creativity and, and art. And um, I love to work with energy and um and men and women, children. It's um, I've done a trauma informed tra- yoga training as well, and so it's it's a lot of it's about releasing trauma and um, going into the shadows, which is what's <laughs> kind of why I'm starting to work a little bit more with that stuff at the moment. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, so check out my website. Thank you for showing it. <laughs> <laughs> do you um, do you still do any of your textiles work? um I don't actually it's um I I love interior design but for me uh textiles really moved it I the I'm trying to think of the word I the specialism I I chose was uh stitch which doesn't really uh give justice to what the girls and my peers were working in it was really mixed media so it was I ended up working a lot with plastic and um, architecture and things like that. And some people were sewing, but others were just really pushing boundaries with what you could use within textiles. And it then became more about space and working with space. So um, I don't actually work with textiles, but I am working more and more with clay um and it actually becomes about touch and bringing that sensation back into the hands and using and working with them so yeah that's kind of how and where 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 I feel like I'm transitioning to now Mm. and so through your journey have there been any people that have really stood out to you and helped your you know the creative side of you grow there have been so many people um I (laughs) Um, I think it's, well, I, I mean, with the architecture thing, uh, thing or that work, (laughs) I was so inspired by Thomas Heatherwick. Um, and I know he did the Olympic flame when it was in London, but the way that he works with architecture just was, um, it really inspired me working with shape, the way that he worked with shapes and a, and a, a similar shape and and the movement within architecture. So that was, he was one of my biggest inspirations for my final project at uni. But um, there are so many amazing artists at the moment that are exploring this, um, exploring work between like the female body and, um, and, and art and expressivity. And there's a girl that's based in Australia called Sophie T, who's very expressive. Um, and she's actually, I think she just opened a gallery up on Carnaby Street um, and her work's amazing. Um, but actually one of my biggest inspirations has been, um, there was actually, there's a lady that I met on the course in Liverpool, Sandy. And she, um, Sandy D'Souza, interestingly because we've got another disease after me but she sandy um works with refugees um but she is so so creative um and it she really she's really inspired me to explore this like creative creative and therapeutic path 
So actually, I feel like it's not necessarily because of her artwork. It's more her, the creativity that just come, like shines through her. So yeah, there have been so many people though, so many. <laughs> I love when people say there's been lots of people. <laughs> it's really nice yeah. to realize all that support. Yeah, and I think it changes, doesn't it, as well, when you're in a, when you're, because you never feel the same way the whole time. So you're interested in, your eye picks up on different things whenever and whatever mood you're in. So they're just, I think that's just constantly, it's like a constant ebb and flow of like creativity and inspiration, so yeah. Oh, brilliant. And, and, and from your journey, do you have any advice that you would give similar creatives and artists that's come from how you've learned and how you've developed? Um, yeah, I think it's something that I massively struggle with, uh, or I have massively struggled with. And actually, even just joining Pure has been like the, one of the biggest steps that I've taken in, or, in kind of actually putting myself out there. But it's don't be afraid of showing up and putting yourself out there. Um, Again, like I say, I'm really trying to actually practice that. <laughs> but if something feels good to you, then try it and do it and um, and honor it, like really honor it. And yeah, so it's, yeah, don't be, don't apologize for who you are and what you want to put out, just do it. Um, I don't Great know advice. Job, actually. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> do it, do it. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't, don't. And I mean, yeah. You start reaping the rewards, don't you, as well? I think yeah, exactly. it's easier said than yeah. done, but it comes very quick. Yeah, completely. And so what is next for you? You've joined Pure. What what do you see as being your next sort of step, if that's like a work of art or...? Um, you... Well, at the moment, I... So I start, I start this um, transpersonal arts course on Monday. So that is a three-year course. So um, I have I think my energy at the moment is really focusing on being present for that but I am really working and I've also, also just my newest project is actually a van so I've just bought a van so I'm going to be doing that up to to create a little home for myself um so oh. that is one of my biggest projects at the moment um but it's what's really interesting with that is that I'm able to step back into that interior design interior stylist point of kind of frame of mind point of view and mm. um do that but I it's working with working with women and drawing them in their like beauty and their rawest form um is what's yeah I'm really looking forward to sharing um so yeah you must keep us updated with how you do your van that sounds amazing that's like a dream <laughs> to do that <laughs> honestly I've been wanting it since I was in South America and this week it happened I was like I am oh, so God. done with waiting so yeah I, I will keep you posted the plan is to you, you can to live in the van did you say yeah that's so cool yeah <laughs> I'm so excited um so I'm, I've spent so much time designing it. I think, like, I'm sure you can appreciate as a creative, your mind, when you get like a blank canvas, it's like, oh my gosh. So I, um, it's taking a lot of time actually just switching off from looking at other people's vans and construction. Yeah, because you go on Pinterest or YouTube and it's just full of people like renovating their vans in these like incredible ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. Honestly, it's inspiring, so. That's what's happening. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, and we've got lots of questions from you, uh, for you. Um, the first one is, uh, yeah. do you work in life class or do you hire models for your work? So I, um, I haven't hired at the moment. I've got some really incredible friends that are very open to being photographed and, um, uh, and they've been incredible at supporting what I want to be doing and I'm doing. Um, so I actually use friends quite a lot um, and keep them anonymous. Um, so I've been really lucky in that way. But I would love to be, um, it was kind of something that I was hoping to do, but then coronavirus, well, COVID happened and um, it was to actually bring creativity into a yoga class. Um, and start to do that. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how you can facilita facilitate that online. And I just, uh, I yeah, I want it to be a safe space. So it's, yeah, 
it, at the moment it's just through friends which I'm very lucky to be able to tap into <laughs> oh wonderful and um, the next question it, it makes it makes from Griselda it makes me laugh because me and my sister actually have this <laughs> um but she says um, very interesting you mentioned seeing colors around people from your from your work um that is an experience some people have it's called synthesis and do you have that is that what you experience Do you know what? I've never heard of synthesis. Um, it's more for me, it's tapping into their aura. Um, and I think that comes with working with like the spiritual um, element. And I'm a, I practice Reiki as well. So um, it's it's looking at that. Um, and that's how you get the colours for your work that yeah, come out. They do, some people, and it's quite funny, there's actually... Yeah, so actually it's this drawing over here. Yeah, that one so it is um when i drew her she um she basically had the most amazing red hair but it was red and and i said oh i didn't see you as red i saw you as green she said well green's my favorite color and so it was just really strange that we just happened to get talking and i just saw her hair as green um but yeah it, it's not synthesis but, um, well, I haven't heard of synthesis. I haven't looked into it, so I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. It, it could be because people get it. So, um, like I say, me and my sister get it with words and with sounds, and they just have certain colors. So maybe you get that, but like you say, with energy. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. Cool. yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, then. Yeah. <laughs> um, how big do you get your drawings <laughs> blown up? I think it's for your prints. So the prints, um, one of them's actually down here. So one of the ladies is kind of as, um, she is, she will come, she's actually going to, would come smaller than she is in real life. Um, but I love working big. Um, it allows, I think it allows more, like, like more expressivity to come out. Um, so if I'm working on a commission, um, then it would be big. But I think when people are buying a, another woman or something else for their home, it's potentially, they potentially want it smaller. So all sorts of sizes. And the last one was, um, would you ever go back to South America? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah, she's she yeah, got a little piece of my heart out there. Um, but it's really interesting. I have for years just never wanted to be in the UK. It's never felt like home, to be honest. Um, and I feel really, really at home here. So that is really lovely. And I think that's kind of part of the reason why um the course at Tobias has kind of opened up and come in because I'm I'm actually really okay with, I'm really happy and at home to be, well, feel home in the UK. So yeah, but I would 100% go back. I've got some amazing friends and teachers out there that I would love to go and work with. So yeah, retreat <laughs> might be happening over there. Um, I, bet, I bet you want to take your van. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, people are saying, Carol's saying, go, you must go. <laughs> I will. Everything's a bit hard at the moment, but I will. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? Everyone's just planning for like next year, late next year. Yeah. Things will happen again. <laughs> I know. Well, I was, it was quite funny. Well, not funny, um, but I was supposed to be going to Bali in April um, mm -hmm. to work on a create some a sustainable and creative shoot out there. And then I was supposed yeah. to be going over to Australia now. And that's all been stopped but it doesn't feel like it's been put on hold it just feels like it's not it's that's not happening now so that's it's actually quite nice to feel good here so yeah that's lovely that's very special yeah <laughs> yeah so here i am back on the screen <laughs> Can you <come> with me? <laughs> that's fascinating catherine really different um, approach to an artistic practice what do you think molly it's just quite unusual um fascinating something different we haven't heard quite that nuance have we i think through these series of interviews 
I was intrigued by the aura when you were talking about the colours, about the aura as well. That really was like, wow. Um, yeah. Because I have the synthesis here. I see the colours around people. And, mm -hmm. and I often sometimes have that strange thing with, with the movement as well. That's odd. I don't know what that's called. That's another thing. Um, mm -hmm. You've been working with Ali Rabjohns, haven't you? So today's yes, quite have. a... Um, again, it's that universe again kind of like randomly chucking it all together. So we were just chatting in the green room and Catherine's been working with Ali. I, obviously Ali's a pure artist, Ali Rab Johns. And um, Susan, who I'm gonna to speak to in a minute, who's sitting down and quietly in the corner, she will pop it, <laughs> um, also knows Ali. And you've been working with Ali. She does a lot of um, therapeutic, around the therapeutic, I did, she taught me how to wet felt years ago mm. Ali so what have you been doing with Ali so I've actually been going to see Ali um I've actually been having some arts therapy with her um so I actually came across Ali last year and um but didn't really it didn't you know when something's not really sticking or it didn't mm. feel right to explore it then and um, contacted her earlier when I got back down in lockdown and it felt really right to go and see her and to work creatively with her but as as a form of therapy um so I've yeah I've been going for my own for my own creativity and my own kind of healing almost um but I'm fascinated by shamanic practices as well so um it was this kind of yeah it it it's so great that she explores both yeah and works. You, the spirit who and doesn't work. know yeah anyone who doesn't know Ali I would recommend you look her up she's yeah um, she's got her own like center where you can go and she's been doing um art therapy and she's a very good uh, Julia Desch actually introduced me to her and uh, yeah she's a very uh wonderful human being but she's she facilitates yeah. like you're saying um she's she holds the space yeah, 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 for growth and for opening and for healing. Yeah, she really does hold that. So, yeah. Mm, yeah, no, I definitely recommend if anyone is getting the vibe that this is something they want to explore, then Ali Rab Johns is definitely someone you need to look up. She is, we were talking to Susan, Rodmel. Rodmel, just outside, yeah. <laughs> just outside Lewis. So, yeah, yeah. And she's a Sussex, Sussex girl. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was fascinating. I absolutely adore your ladies. Thank you. My lovely they are ladies. stunning. <laughs> They're stunning. And if you've Thank got you. friends who look like that, you're very lucky. I know. I, you know what? I don't know what that means. I just feel, I mean, like, all women are beautiful, aren't they? So it is this, I just feel really lucky that I've got women around me that are open enough to say, you know, here I am, you know, yeah, photograph me and work with me and, and all that. So yeah, I mean, yeah, very lucky. <laughs> we all need it. We all need our friends, don't we? We all need yeah. our friends, and especially during a period of time like this, like you say, you know, for many, it has been incredibly difficult, but for others, it's been a time of healing and a time of um, yeah. giving and being able to just sit back and come just, home you know, as well. Yeah. Restore. Don't let my daughter yeah. hear you because she's had to stay in Manchester and she is not happy about that situation. <laughs> I think we've got another couple of questions just suddenly appeared down here. Um, ah, so Nadine's saying, as you are attuned to Reiki and practice yoga, do you create any anything around chakras and their lovely colours? Um, I don't. It's something that I haven't... Um, I have thought about, but it didn't really feel right to explore. It was... Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I love some work that I've seen that does work in that way, but it's not, it's not been for me. It's not been at, at the moment. It's not how it works. Who been, knows though? Thank you for the question. Yeah. Exactly. Who like knows? <laughs> on a journey, aren't you? you? You're very much on your journey. And yeah, that's so, so lovely. Um, that I was saying, um, yesterday I think when I was chatting to Carol who's also textiles and drawing and everything I said I have a fear of the known now that's what I kind of the outcome of lockdown has given me a, yeah. a fear of the known as opposed to a fear of the unknown because it's been 
it's been challenging yeah. and frightening but also exciting and stimulating and now I love that I love the idea we don't know what's around the corner so just listen to your intuition and you are the absolute epitome of following yeah. your following your heart and your soul yeah just keep going honey I can't <laughs> wait to see where you go it's van. taken work it's taken really <laughs> hard work on <laughs> so many levels <laughs> oh the my van, god though, yeah. you're gonna have to post some pictures of the van up on instagram because you are on our instagram wall today hang on a second i'm going to show everyone this because i was just when i bring up the magazine on the magazine page we have the wall as everyone knows we have the wall and look who's on our wall prime spot on the wall so today you need to be more Catherine. <laughs> Han, you, you've managed to knock Hannah off the top slot today. I think we may have just, uh, we, I think we may have lost Catherine slightly there. But so uh, that was timing. <laughs> yeah, but fortunately. The internet we, held out. Yeah, but... the internet held out just enough. Hello. So we're going to bring, but we're going to bring Susan back. Yay. Hello. Thank you for your patience, Susan. <laughs> And Catherine just disappeared on us, so hopefully she's okay. <laughs> and she's going to post some... She's obviously gone off just to post some pictures of her van. I obviously. Think that's, I think that's what she's doing. Thank you, my love. Thank you, Molly. That was brilliant. And a really interesting artist. Yeah, I really loved uh, I really loved it. Very gentle, very... Um, um, from, the, from her very heart, and that was lovely to hear. Because um, she's quite young and, you know, on that beginning part of her journey. So, yeah, it's lovely. Thank you, Molly. I'm going to pop you down in the corner. <laughs> and, uh, Molly, you're back on Tuesday, I think, aren't you? Tuesday, I... Monday. Yeah, Monday. I was going to say, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, no, I think you're back on Monday. With, uh, and you're talking to Hannah. And yes. I will be talking to Felicity. Because Felicity and it has now sorted out her... Um, internet uh louisa crispin very kindly went over and um did a little bit of tech and got that sorted so yes i will be here tomorrow with nadine but um catherine catherine said thank you we do you're welcome catherine we loved you catherine (laughs) i hope it wasn't anything we said (laughs) she's gone Uh, but yes so i'll be back tomorrow with nadine and uh, molly you'll see molly again on monday so i'm going to drop uh molly down in the corner bye everyone (laughs) And um, Susan and I are going to have a chat. So see you in a bit, Molly. There she goes. There she goes. So how are you? That was fascinating, wasn't it? Oh, that was great. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear about the connections between travel and art and and yoga and art and, yeah, all all the different ways that um, Catherine's creativity has flourished. Yeah, and the the association with Rodmel and Ali Rabjohns. Yes. Yeah, and which we're going to chat about. Yes, I was going to say I'll tell you about how I came into contact with Ali as well. Yeah. So let's just quickly before we do all that, we're just going to quickly show your page in the magazine, so that everyone knows how they can contact you. So yesterday I got all myself in a pickle and showed the ma- showed the uh, website first. I think I'm not tired, but maybe my inner soul is a little bit tired. <laughs> oh. <laughs> maybe just a little bit there you are so there you are Susan and beautiful textile work again you know we've been so privileged to see some amazing textiles we had Carol yesterday with her beautiful um, feathers and today your stitching is exquisite so here you can see you can contact um, Susan um, her email and there's her website we're going to have a little look at that later and her Instagram page. And again, everyone's Instagram pages are just amazing. So, yeah. I'm going to hand the stage over to you, Susan. And I just, yeah, let us tell us, where did it all begin? What's your earliest memories of arting? Oh, okay. Well, um, I think I, as a young child I, I liked sewing and drawing and it was just something that I always did I always remember having cross stitch kits or um, you know working with threads or knitting or all sorts of textiles and I was headed it was always seen as a hobby in my house so it was kind of you can do that but you've got to you know focus on what subjects you're going to choose for your for your um, A-level your GCSEs and A-levels and I 
both my parents were scientists, so I started to go down a, a science route. And um, just before I picked my A levels, I, I spent my evenings drawing um, and sewing. And I thought, what am I doing? I, you know, I really want to do A level art. And I had to persuade the art teacher and my family that that was the right thing. Um, but I was asked to do a GCSE in textiles and graphics to, to sort of show commitment to joining the art course. And as soon as I got into the arts block um, at school, I just felt at home. And that was, you know, where my real kind of sense of taking a bit more control of my life and thinking about what I wanted to do in the future took off. Um, where was home? Where was home? Home was in Yorkshire. So funnily enough, same as Catherine, I went to um, Art Foundation in Leeds. That was my, my next step. So, um, yeah, it, it is a great art foundation course there. Um, it was part of Jacob Kramer College when I went there. Um, and I had a very inspiring teacher there called Sue Lorty, who was a weaver. And she used to take us out onto Ilkley Moor to make sculptures and do natural dyeing in buckets. And we made a mess everywhere. And um, she really was the person I think that you know concreted the idea that it was textiles that I was interested in and passionate about and wanted to study. Um, so I went to Huddersfield and did a degree in textile design um, where we looked at knit, weave and print and learned a lot um, about the, the sort of industry side and the technical side and, and the design side of things and then um, I did a sandwich year placement with Marks and Spencers in London in Baker Street as a trainee buyer. And that was really the beginning of my career in, in textiles and fashion. And um, I, I actually was lucky enough to have a year out because a bit like at the moment, everything, it was you know not as um, serious as what's happening now with COVID, but there were, um, there was a big, crash, financial crash, and so all the jobs and work placements and things stopped. Um, and I had a year where I went to Paris with not very much money, lived in a tent for a while um, with my partner at the time and managed to get some internships with companies out there. So worked for a, a trend prediction bureau and worked for Casherelle designing knitwear for their children's wear range. Um, and that was a fantastic year. Um, I think I might have carried on as a freelance designer at that point if I hadn't had the job to come back to at Marks and Spencers. They kept the jobs open. So I returned and had seven years in London working in uh, lingerie, children's wear, uh, women's accessories and men's tailoring. So had some great opportunities there to travel and and learn about the world in in um in terms of um industry and retail um but i always felt like i didn't quite fit there in that corporate environment and it it was um you know towards the end it was quite a struggle being there um and i i knew that i wanted to do something that connected me back again to textiles in a more creative way so I, I moved to Brighton and there I joined um, an interior textile company for a short period of time um, and then made the decision to train as a, an art teacher, art and textile teacher. So I did a one year PGCE and um, again, being back in that art environment, just really enjoyed that year. It was a fantastic year working with um, people training as music teachers, theatre teachers, um, and that was what led to really the rest of my uh, career as a, as a textile lecturer. So I started working for a college in Kent, West Kent College, in 2003, and um, have had an amazing career there teaching, starting with A-level textiles, we set up a BTEC, um, another great colleague and myself, and then 
um, went on to create a degree program that there was a real demand for for people to move on from um, the BTEC course. And um, yeah, I've had the privilege of working with lots of fantastic students over the years. Um, but all the time trying to eke out bits of time to carry on making my own work, um, which started to be more focused on a combination of hand painting, applique, stitch. Um, and I did exhibitions in open houses, um, small scale exhibitions. Um, and then eventually in 2000 and nine I think it was I um, decided to do an MA at Brighton uh, just to really immerse myself again a bit more in in my own practice and um, to do something a bit more focused and with with my work so I uh, did a part-time two-year MA and um, some of the work behind me in that area is is from that um, project which was a, a year-long project working in my own garden. Um, oh, can and... you bring some of that closer to the screen? Yeah. It looks amazing. Oh. Just see if I can do that without... Yeah, without dragging the laptop off. <laughs> I'm always terrified when I ask people to do that, that as, as they walk away, the laptop crashes. <laughs> so, I'm wired, so yeah, I have to unplug my... Uh... I'll, I'll see if I can show you some of the images. Oh, wow, look at that. So this oh. is all inspired by your garden, and this was for your MA? Yeah, this was for my MA, and I'll show you actually some of the... It's a bit difficult to see on here, yeah. but, um, yeah, the it involved really trying to capture things at the moment where they break down and working right. with Stitch to intervene to try and hold that moment and it was about transience and the fragility of, you know, things that are, um, well, nature's constantly moving and constantly um, decaying and moving on to the next stage. So that one, for example, was about, um, it was a blossom from a pear tree and just trying to gather that as it was uh, very temporarily there. Um, and then that culminated in some studio photographs where I had done some darning and some crochet into some of these um, seed pods and leaves. Um, it was sort of about loss. Some of the images are, mm. um, you know, a little bit uncomfortable to look at. Um, and it was linked to various things that were going on in my life at that time. Uh, those last ones are darned um, fragments of seed pods. So it was very delicate work. And the um, the act of intervening really broke down these objects even further. So it was quite futile, but it was more the process and then recording those images um, that I was interested in, just to try and, and capture that moment. It's interesting when you were saying uh, you were saying about the the seed pod, and I looked at the seed pod, and I was like. Wow, you can really see that um, this person has worked in the textiles industry and you said men's tailoring. <laughs> and that just struck me when I was looking at the, the seed pod uh, with the tailoring aspect of how you've tailored it back together. Um, it's amazing how they, all those influences embed in us and just appear. And that may not have been in your mind, but that's just something that you know kind of came to my mind when I was looking at it. So that was the work that you did on the MA. How has that evolved since the MA? Um, well, since the MA, I um, I suppose the next sort of larger exhibition that I did was um, one that Ali Ravjohn, who we were talking about, invited me to join with her, which was a group exhibition. And that was um, based in Sussex Prairie Gardens. Um, and we had a residency over the summer to produce work, exhibit it, and then be there certain days, run workshops, that kind of thing. Um, and we had quite a long lead time into that. We had a year, um, so similar to my MA project, it was this opportunity to work quite slowly and really look at things um, and notice the details um, and, and absorb yourself in the process because I'm, I'm quite interested in, you know, what I really enjoy about 
textiles is, is the process and, and getting absorbed in that. Um, and then seeing what comes out of that, you know, having some goals, but not being too led by the end product. So, so what, did, what came out? Um, well, what came out of that was a series of 12 images. So I did one for each month. Uh, I've got, yeah, I don't know how well you can see that. I'll move it a little bit because it's quite textural. So that one was just some seat heads um, and some grasses. There's quite a lot of machine embroidery on that. Um, and the other images, so these ones have got plastic on. These are Gicle prints of the original textiles, but um, that one was Ney with all the alliums. Um, and I really just spent each month photographing and then you know honing in on um trying to capture the character of the gardens in that month um the gardens are burnt down in february and then come up again each year it's very much an annual garden so those shifts in texture and in color um really change it quite dramatically from one month to the next uh, as it moves on um, so it was a really enjoyable project to be involved in. And you sold some of that work by the looks of it, because you're saying they're the prints from it. So yeah. you sold the originals. I did. I sold, I made 12 and I sold um, eight. And I actually remade one of them a couple of times for different people because there were particular one images that people liked. Um, and that was, that was great for my confidence in my own work because I um, you know hadn't had that experience before of, of selling of people wanting my work in that way and I've, I've since sold cards and prints and calendars from that exhibition which have continued to, to be popular. Um, so is selling something that you aspire to do or is it just that was just a byproduct? That, ha well, that happened to happen. Mm, it was quite different from my MA exhibition in a way, which was much more conceptual. And yeah, this one was more about having the wall space in order to sell work at the exhibition. Um, but I approached it in a similar way in terms of taking time to create the images. Um, but I think I would like to continue to sell work. I like producing work that people want to own or to have or enjoy in that way. So, um, yeah, so definitely. I mean, I, I still um, am making some new textile originals at the moment or just starting to, um, and I would like to exhibit those at some point and, and I, I like making prints from them as well because the difficulty with very fine uh, stitch work is the number of hours that go into producing it that it makes yes. it sort of unachievable to sell it for the hours you put in or to you know for people to be able to afford it so yeah we um, had that conversation with Carol yesterday about how do you how do you price something that takes you know 150 days mm -hmm. to create and how did you feel? How does it feel when you've sold something that's taken you a year to create? How, how did that feel? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, there were one or two of those images that it was quite hard to let go of them. Um, and for me, that year was a year of getting over quite a difficult time in life, which I won't go into now. But, you know, there were, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot that had gone on in that year in creating that work. Um, but ultimately that was, you know, I'd put prices on them. I wanted to share it with people. If people, if I was lucky enough that people wanted to own those things, mm. then I was very happy that they went to um, people that would enjoy them. So you've learned quite a lot from that experience to take into future selling experiences. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and how, how would you now approach it with that learning how would you approach like the pricing and the packaging and the reproductions now um i think i would value my work more i think when i look back i underpriced it in terms of the amount of um thought and um you know biggest danger with artists is never overpricing 
Mm. <laughs> it's always <laughs> yeah. under for icing. Yeah. yeah, and and I would always do, um, you know, maybe limit it, but have G clay prints because with textiles, I think the colour comes out really nicely on them. And I, I found that sometimes people are a bit put off by textile work because they don't really understand it, whereas they're more comfortable with a print. Um, so it's nice to have that option, um, you know, as another way to enjoy the art. Yeah, GK prints is a, is a controversial area of discussion, but I think <laughs> if you do it with integrity and honesty and you say these are GK prints and you price them accordingly as if they were a postcard or a card etc then it's absolutely fine for someone like yourself whose original pieces take so many hours to create Mm -hmm. that you couldn't possibly um, charge the price until unless you were incredibly famous like Tracy Emin or whatever um, so I think it's just about making sure that you're very honest when you when you price them and when you sell them with the Gicle because it you know it's that it's not an original no no and it's I, a very different I, thing it's yeah. a very different beast and I think you know quite rightly original printmakers get very very edgy about that kind of stuff but I I think intelligently it's the right thing to do and I've had a conversation with people about their lockdown journals and such like and and you know the resistance they don't want to sell it it's a it's a historical document isn't it it's something that is very precious that happened during a very interesting time and making G clay prints from that is okay as long as you're honest and have integrity about you know what you're doing and pricing yeah. accordingly so it's a reproduction absolutely Vincent it's a reproduction print and that's you know how you do it but I think it's an intelligent way to approach it for a textile artist such as yourself so the other exhibition that I'm intrigued and really interested to hear about is the one you did at Ditchling Museum yes. mm. Yeah, so Tell us about that, how that came about and how, how that happened. Um, well, that was an opportunity that I heard about that Ditchling Museum, um, who'd had an exhibition linked to natural dyeing, were um, offering 12 places for that you could apply to be part of a group that was going to be taught for a year by um, a master natural dyer called Jenny Dean. Um, and so I applied for that exhibition. You had to write about your work and about you know your interests, and was accepted. Um, and it was one Sunday a month for a year, um, and we worked through. Um, well, Jenny very um, generously shared her knowledge with us on how to, you know, dye authentically and to use mordants and modifiers and to get colour that's. Um, fast and that's not going to wash out and that's not just a stain um, and it was yeah it was a fantastic year learning about that so that come I've got a few things here so we did things like a sample book where we worked through all the different uh, colors so um, you know using different plant mainly plant based dyes but chopped roots leaves that kind of things oh, that um, looks amazing that looks like a sweet shop <laughs> <laughs> it, it's fast i mean when you see the range of color that's possible with natural dyes um i'll just show you one other thing um, oh i've been looking at that hanging behind you I've been watching that hanging behind you thinking, I'm going to ask about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I made a sampler with, um, and I've embroidered on top the names of the dyes, which might be back to front on here. But, no, no, uh, it's all fine. It's okay. Yeah, it's all um, fine. Rhubarb. So, yeah. Rhubarb. Um, <laughs> and Go some... slower. <laughs> Cochineal. Cochineal, <laughs> yeah. Kutch, Alphanet. Yeah. Uh, Walnut. Walnut, yeah. And... Goodness, the beautiful colours, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, really beautiful. And people tend to think of natural dyeing as being kind of murky browns and greens, which are lovely colours in themselves. But there, there are a lot, there's a you know, much greater richness to it. Yes. Um, so during, as we got more confident with learning the process of how to, how to achieve colour, um, we were starting to dye our own samples. And the group of people on that course included... 
um, weavers, paper makers, um, t teachers, um, people working in all different areas of, of creativity. Um, so everybody was producing slightly different work. And I started to do uh, sort of small, these are like my sketches, I suppose, but in, in textiles. So these Just were like... Just lift them really, up a little bit. There yeah. we go. Just up a little bit. That's yeah. perfect. So these were really small um, appliques with uh, bits of embroidery on them. Um, and I was kind of keen to take it further into landscape-based textiles um, using naturally dyed uh, both fabrics and threads and I just felt it had more authenticity um, doing that with my work because the MA project that I'd done had a sustainable angle in that I wanted to use materials that existed and I wanted them to almost go back into the earth so there was nothing left but the photographs from that MA project mm. I didn't want to acquire lots of stuff in in the process of, of making it um, and the Sussex Prairie one was about nature and studying nature, but I was using, um, you know, chemical dyes to hand paint and buying in materials. So I think this course just gave me the next direction, which was to continue with the applique and the, and the stitch based work. So I really enjoy that process, but to start to use the plant dyes so that it, it was, um, you know, more authentic uh, as natural work if it was going to be about nature I didn't want to bring lots of chemicals and you know bits flown in from Hong Kong and all that sort of thing um, yes. so I've got I'll just bring that one back. So, so that one is um, again, I don't know how well you can see that but that sort of layers of fabric that have been dyed with a combination of walnut and uh, welds over dyed with indigo and alkanet um, and then there's some embroidered details on that one mm. um, so I started making a series of work like that um, of different landscapes Sussex landscapes um, and I'm currently working on a sketchbook with with those pieces um, and, would, and would like I've got a a plan to walk the South Downs way and to record that um, through photographs. It's going to be another long, longish project to do, um, but to just try and, and and capture that and and some of some of the landscapes of that journey. So that will feed into another body of work that hopefully yeah. we'll see appear in a. Yeah. beautiful setting sometime in the <laughs> next be, year or so. <laughs> that was lovely, yes, yeah. I, I, I mean, I've done about six so far of just general Sussex landscapes. So that one is um, Selsey think, Bill. Is that one of them that there's a section of it in the magazine? Yeah, that's yes, right. I thought that's so. One yeah. that, and it's an aerial photograph of Selsey Bill, um, which... I took from a plane on a plane ride so that was a more unusual one but um, I, d I do like the photography you know capturing the images and spending time looking before I um, choose what I'm going to focus on. So that's kind of part of your process is the sketching yes. and the photographing and the contemplating Yeah. before definitely. you actually, I love that slow art. <laughs> yeah slow, slow textile, slow stitch there is a movement and um, you know, I mean, I teach currently in a, in a college and have for many years, but I, I would really like to run workshops that are maybe a bit smaller and are more independent and are focusing more on um, areas like natural dyeing and stitch and just slowing down and enjoying that and enjoying the connection with nature as well as a part of it. Did you, during lockdown, did you do a project? Did you do something um, particular? I, I suppose I did because I, we realised we were going to be closing down and we were trying to get all the students to get their projects as progressed as possible before we went into endless Zoom teaching with them, which was quite challenging to make um, fashion and textile collections. Um, and I borrowed the college's wax pots and... Um, 
I've focused a bit on batik work, so working with dye as a resist um, and hand painting, but working with natural dyes to create extracts. Um, and it was something that I wanted to do because, again, the process of creating each colour with the natural dye vats takes quite a long time. Um, and I wanted to have a range of colours that I could just paint with and do work a bit more spontaneously. So that was something that I, before lockdown, I'd have a session with Jenny, um, the teacher, just to help me along the road with that, um, because it's something there's not that much information out there about, but I've now managed to make um, extracts of quite a range of dyes and paint with those. Um, so it's really a sketchbook at the moment, but I did run a couple of workshops at Sussex Prairies in August. Um, with small groups where I taught that technique and, and we worked with batik um, oh, wow. and yeah that was that was really enjoyable but I like the idea of mixing that painting with the dyes with stitch as well as you know cutting cutting and piecing is is get a particular result but to be able to hand paint as well is is a bit more freeing Teaching seems to be a really, really crucial element of what you do. Yes, yeah. I, I, I Sharing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think I enjoy helping people and helping their creativity. Um, but I, I'm definitely moving into a phase where I would like to um, focus a bit more on developing my own work. Uh, I think I'll always want to teach, but it might be shifting into, you know, into different ways or into um, a bit more um, focus on making work um, and doing some of the things that I've spent so many years um, encouraging students to do. I'd like to do those things myself now. <laughs> so, um, Have yeah. you seen any of the students go on and become textile artists or designers and yes yeah definitely um we've we've had students that have gone on to um set up their own businesses and um, screen print workshops or sell interior textile pieces we've had students that have gone on to be pattern cutters or to do um computer aided design and illustration um gone on to do mas they've gone into teaching um, and in fact, I was trying to work out the other day, I was thinking about how many students I've taught in the time, of the 17 years I've been at that college, and I, I think it must be over a thousand. Um, not all on the degree, but um, it's, it's been a real privilege to see, um, you know, all the, all the different journeys that people have gone on as a result of um, getting that bug for creativity and art it is amazing isn't it because i mean we've done now 26 days of of interview solid and no and sometimes two in a day like today and and although there's crossovers and there's synergy and there's essences of um similarity every single journey has been unique and something completely a little twist in the tail and then it led to something completely unexpected and I love that. I love that about the how how creativity can be so therapeutic and so supportive, but it can also be so exciting mm -hmm. and unexpected. Yeah. And you just yeah. don't know where it's going to go. No, that's it. I think once once people have the confidence to be it sounds a bit corny but to be true to themselves and to to do you know to express a part of their own nature that um only they can you know select the colors they're going to work with and what they're going to um the kind of marks they're going to make and yeah it, it's really fascinating yeah very special to be the like you know say you know the teacher the one who kind of set them on that journey have any of them come back to the college um well, oh yes, they come back and visit. They definitely come back and we have an end of year show and very often we see them at that. Um, I was going to say some of them have ended up 
being heads of textiles at local schools and that kind of thing. Oh, wow. They haven't come back to teach with us um, so far, but um, yeah, that, that's been really nice to see. Um, Little secret, I did art at West Kent College as well. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Some of the staff have been there for, you know, quite a while. I don't know who you were taught by, but... <laughs> it was a man, I can't remember now. It was a long oh. time ago. It was a long yeah. time ago. Many yeah. years ago, but yeah, and I and I think to myself then, you know, as you, you know, you went into a quite a commercial environment. I went out into the world, and you know, we were having this conversation with Susan and Molly. You know, you go out into the world, and and you find that you're not in alignment with yourself, and you're not doing what you truly want, and you do burn out, and then mm. suddenly you land on this thing, and you're like, okay, I'm, and I've never wanted to. I have no desire to stop what doing what I'm doing now, <laughs> which good. is an amazing feeling, isn't it? And that's, yeah. you know, that's very yeah. much this creative environment. You've spent some time with Ali mm. as well, quite a lot of time in her environment, doing things with Ali. Has she taught you other things about creativity? Um, yes, I think, um, I think... Ali's very encouraging and, and supportive in a very subtle way that that helps you to believe in yourself a bit more. So I, I think I've definitely learned from her in that sense. And she's very open and generous as well. So, um, yeah, just a little bit feeds back to what you were saying about each person being so individual. So there is enough space for everybody to oh, produce gosh, yeah. what they produce. and. And, um, you know, it takes away any sense of competition or... Um, Absolutely. I was uh, just intrigued by the teacher being taught. It's that dynamic. <laughs> I was like, the teacher being taught oh. is an interesting dynamic, isn't yeah. it? Well, Which... I was going to say that I don't... I mean, the kind of teaching I'm doing, I'm, I feel I'm facilitating. The students yeah. very often know what they want to do and they just need guidance. So I... I you know don't feel like I'm teaching in a teachery way <laughs> yeah and probably Ali would say the same thing I should mm. think uh, we've got some questions oh, okay got some questions which I would like to see and anyone else who's got some questions pop them in the ask a question area so um, Annie says where where were you left to yourself on your MA or did you get um, a lot of tuition um, she did that at Brighton Yes, at Brighton. It was art and design by independent practice, um, the MA that I did. And I had, um, at the time, you know, fantastic teachers there. Um, it was quite um, independently driven. There was one day a week in the university and one day was uh, independent study. And um, we had uh, people doing that MA who were doing... Uh, metalwork, jewellery, sculpture, graphic design, um, all sorts of different disciplines. So we tended to maybe have, um, um, we were given briefs, but they were very open. And we might have a, a group workshop once every three weeks. Um, the afternoon was normally um, an, an artist talk of some kind. Um, uh, um, or a film about a different aspect of art, but it was very holistic. So I know they said to us at the beginning of the MA that, you know, when you come to your degree, you come to be taught, but when you come to an MA, you're bringing what, what you, your experience and your specialisms to it, and then you're getting guidance on what you can do with that. Um, so, Would you recommend? That is a as a good course, the one I, I would. I mean, it was quite. It was obviously ten years ago I did it, so I don't know. The staff may not be the same. It was Professor George Hardy was running it when I was there, and he's he's great. Um, and Margaret Huber. I'm not sure who's running the course now because they they can be quite personal things. It depends, you know, who the staff are. But I think you know most of the University of Brighton staff I've I've met are, are very committed and all practicing artists themselves and. Um, I think it's a, you know it's been an art college for a long time, so they have a really good ethos there. Um, 
and and it and for an MA, it's really it's really the staff and the the input you're getting from them that's the important thing. Yeah, absolutely. I did my masters at Brighton as well. Oh, and did you? I would highly recommend Brighton as a, a university. I think it was an incredibly good experience, and mm-hmm. I felt very yeah supported through the experience. Yeah, so, so that hopefully that answers your question. Emma. Yeah, I'd say to anyone thinking about it, go for it. You know, especially at the moment, just go back in yeah. and <laughs> learn. What other what other advice would you give? Do you have any other kind of key advice? Um, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things I often say is is to just allow yourself time to experiment and to play and to see what comes out of that mm. um, and 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 stay open to things that are out of your comfort zone because i'm giving this advice and it's harder sometimes to do it than, <laughs> than to tell others to do it but not you know not to get too sort of obsessed with end goals and outcomes um you know to allow yourself time to see what happens along the way yeah it's human nature we get kind of focused on the end don't we and yeah you just need yeah. to kind of give yourself permission to play. Yes. And yes. Uh, like you say, you, you know, you've you been very lucky to have those couple of really long projects. And uh, so you've seen the benefit of of that experience. Yeah. Annie's saying, do you self-publish your books? I haven't. No, well, the, what, the one I was showing was, um, it was, uh, I think it was an Apple um, book that I just, you know, downloaded the photos or uploaded the photos and Mm. created it that way. But I have had people ask about that book when I've, when I've shown it at previous times. Mm. So um, maybe that's a new project. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's true, there's a bit of a story to the the projects I've done. So it could be a nice way. Um, See, that's another way of selling the project without selling the original art, isn't mm. it? So you keep that original art piece but you know another vehicle because it, as I said it is contentious that whole thing of selling um, mm. reproductions and and quite rightly so but it's looking at what the answer is and the books I think is an incredibly good idea and they're so um, they're so tactile as well you could almost you know add a little bit of embellishment onto them couldn't you mm. oh but these are good ideas yeah there's an idea there's yeah, an idea exactly. embellish the book yeah embellish the book and so each one is unique like an original printmaker might do yeah yeah um, that's a really nice idea there you go full of ideas me <laughs> <laughs> and carol says would you draw or collect objects during your south downs walks the one you're con- considering doing yeah. is your like next project. I think I would because I always have. I mean, I've got on my desk here very, my latest pot of things that I've been collecting, and there's stones here and shells, and um, I constantly do collect objects, and you know, I'm um, uh, studying them and sketching them and photographing them. Um, very often putting things in my pocket so um, yeah that would that would be a nice way to sort of have some primary source um, research as well. They looked really interesting colours those leaves. Oh yeah. They they're, weren't they're... straightforward <laughs> leaves were they? No they're, they're um, I've forgotten the name of the it's a smoke bush but they they do go quite interesting colours I've um, yeah. pressed quite a lot of these because I did over lockdown I started stitching into leaves again which I haven't really done since my MA project um, but yeah just to try and uh, capture them again did you see Carol with the paper yes you Carol's see? work's beautiful that would really transfer into a paper stitched item wouldn't it quite um, well mm. yeah there's another idea <laughs> and, and Ali says you could show your work in series in a book there you go. Yeah. That's a really good idea as well. Yeah, putting it into series. Mm-hmm. I think the book idea, because the um, it's it has a lot of integrity, doesn't it? Putting mm-hmm. it into a book, um, and that sounds like a, yeah. If that, yeah, if that, no, that's, if that, that's that appeals, a great idea. Then, it uh, does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because both the projects had, you know, there were emotional reasons for doing them, and it might be quite interesting to touch on those as well. And the book would give the opportunity to talk a bit more about that. So yeah. yeah. And you get the wax pot out on, uh, uh, 
do you get the wax pops out on the leaves? Um, oh, I haven't tried actually putting wax on the leaves. Um, oh. But I know you can use it on wood and on different materials. So um... I think Annie needs to come round to your studio and, <laughs> and, and help you experiment because I think that she's got some really good ideas. Mm, she's definitely. incredibly creative. <laughs> um, you show this work on your website. Let's have a look mm. on your website because you've got some of it on there, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, let's have a quick look on your on your website. There we go. So, um, gallery here. So this is one of your. This is. Let me bring that up, and then we'll give your website the screen temporarily, and you can talk us through what we're looking at. Okay. So, um, so that first block of work is the more recent landscape-based work with natural dyes. So the top three are batik, and then the bottom three are applique. Um, and they're slightly less decorative than the things I did at Sussex Prairie, um, which, are, which are the ones below. So yeah, that's one of the batik ones, the, the wax resist areas. Yes. So this is what you, you did during lockdown? Um, yes, and these are uh, indigo, kutch, walnut um, that I've hand painted with. Uh -huh. And then we go on to the stitched. Yeah, so that's a close-up detail from the um, uh, piece that I showed earlier. And do you dye the thread as well as the fabric? Uh, well, I, I, on that one there's a mixture, but I would like it all to be naturally dyed. So some of the pieces, um, the, the sort of darker one with the silhouetted trees, that is all natural dyed threads. But this one has got some machine embroidery threads in it, which are need to be rayon to, to do machine embroidery. You need right. a particular tension of thread. But that one, the, the stitch along the top and the sort of gold stitch, uh, they, those are naturally dyed. Yeah. I was intrigued by that because, you know, when you're dyeing all, and you've got a frayed part there as well, haven't you? The fraying yeah. across here. Because um, when you're, yeah, the inter again, it's just that integrity, isn't it, of um, what you're doing, mm. um, how uh, how you're getting those colours in the stitch. They're stunning. Thank you so much. Oh, That's been you. fascinating, and and I've really enjoyed these last couple of days. You know, really focusing in on these textile artists. I haven't um, obviously know Julia incredibly well, and we've. But we have, you know, predominantly we see painters and people who draw and it's just so interesting to hear the nuances of the practice. Yeah, well, it's been, uh, it's been really enjoyable um, talking to you tonight, Leslie, and yeah, oh, just thank the input you. from the others that are there. Thank yeah, you they're all. just so giving, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. they're just, it's great having this live audience. I really love that, to have the live audience because they're so generous with their thoughts and it's, mm -hmm. it's inspirational. And thank you as well, um, Catherine and Molly, for earlier. That was great. And we will see you all tomorrow when I'll be chatting to Nadine, who is um, a holistic practitioner. So she does Reiki, etc. So we do, as we, um, as a practice, we look after the whole person. So we like to hear about energy and meditation and all of the things that um, all of us, artists or not artists, need to... Um, keep ourselves happy and well and thriving so yeah i've been looking forward to speaking to you tomorrow nadine and thank you susan that's been an absolute pleasure thank and you. thank you catherine and molly and we'll see you all tomorrow okay take care bye